Kipling, you're going to get dates all over the place. So he says there is no absolute reliable long-term radiological clock. And that is a true statement, and it is a valid statement because it has been validated. Now, constancy of decay rate is most essential to the process. Otherwise, it's worthless. Okay? So any artifacts or rocks that you date using these techniques depend upon, of course, the isotope having a decay rate that is stable over time. As I said before, we have no other way to depend upon the measurement if that's not true. Now, this all relates then, as I said a, re uh, a few minute moments ago, to the energetics of the nucleus. Okay? And that energy is a very high energy in the nucleus. It's measured in terms of millions of electron volts of energy. Uh, an electron volt is technically, you can't quite read that, but it's the uh, kinetic energy that is required to accelerate an electron uh, through a potential of one volt of electricity, right? The amount of energy required to accelerate an electron. Remember, electrons move in conductors, that's what causes electricity. The amount of energy to select that, to accelerate that through one volt is called an electron volt. Well, if you multiply, you know what a volt, a nine volt battery is, or one and a half volt battery is, or 12 volt automobile battery, right? So think about that and then multiply it out a million times. And you've got MeV, millions of electron volts, enormous energy in the nucleus. So you're going to need enormous energy to affect it, right? Isotopes of lower nucleus stability have faster decay rates. We know that for a fact. And they have much shorter half-lives. That's a testament to the fact that higher energy is right in line with what? Greater decay rate or accelerated decay rate. Second point. Isotopes of higher nuclear stability have slower decay rates and, of course, longer half-lives. There's a direct correlation between the rate of decay and the amount of energy uh, affording the stability or the instability to that particular isotopic nucleus. Now, here's an important point. Decay rates cannot be reduced. There's no way to do that. They are what they are because the energetics of the nucleus is determined by the particles in the nucleus. But they can be accelerated. So the isotopic nucleus absorbing more energy than it contains for maintaining its structural stability. That's how it's going to do it. If it absorbs more energy than what the energy that it contains to maintain its stability, then you're going to have an instabil instability problem, right? Now, we threw this in here because uh, it relates to the dating question. Here's some data that the people at ICR did with the rate project when they dated the diffusion of helium out of zircons. And uh, here is a conventional relationship here that's uh, expanding, as you see, over a temperature range of roughly 300 to 350 degrees uh, Celsius uh, in a 1.5 billion year time frame. Well, the measurements they took on new sampling given to independent laboratories and then looking at those rates of decay gave a very different time frame for the same kind of data. And they gave this kind of relationship here. Okay? Expands a time frame of about 6,000 uh, 6, years, roughly. Now, they did this based upon ice, uh, the uh, diffusion rates of the helium coming out of the rocks. And the way it was treated, if you read the proceedings from the uh, ICC with regard to the, or read one of the uh, rate project proceedings, that's the best way to get it, uh, you'll notice that they use some diffusion equations to determine that. And there is one objection to this in some sense because those diffusion equations did not contain temperature dependence, which is a factor in exchanging the diffusion rate. However, I think by and large they're in the right time frame, even though, because you know, this is not an enormous temperature change to enormously affect the diffusion rate. I mean, they will affect it to some degree. The thing I would be most concerned about is the instantaneous decay as that helium leaves that parent isotope is going to be an enormous amount of energy locally right there in that nucleus. So that helium is going to kick out of there 
at an extremely fast rate for a short period of time, of course, before it levels off. Now, if we had a way of measuring that, that would give us a much better handle. Okay? So I'm not saying don't trust this. I'm saying you might be able to trust it in terms of order of magnitude. I think that's reasonable. But in terms of exactness, there would be some questions if you want to look at the technical aspects of the whole matter. Okay, another aspect of this is the sequence of events places the burden of disproof on the critics, of course, because they must explain how, if there is no truth in this model, that the data accidentally, by sheer coincidence, just happened to have fallen the right predictions of the model. That's what Russ Humphreys said. He said, we're looking at a biblical time frame within a five or six thousand year time frame, and these data seem to be consistent with that. So he said, he's presuming that it's not, uh, that you believe, and I think you do, that they're being as honest as they can based upon the methods they use, that uh, this was reasonably good data, and it's a reasonably good conclusion. Okay? So that's what he's basing that on. Now here's another important quote by Fred Uniman. He made this some years ago. Uh-oh. Okay? And he said, this could mean that the atomic clocks are reset during some global disaster. Oh, yes, indeed. And what was that global disaster? F-L-O-O-D, right? I mean, do you have any evolutionists that will accept, died in the wool, I'm not talking about creationists, but the die in the wool non-creationists that will accept the universal flood? I haven't found one. I have not found one. Okay, so this is the question. And of course, Uniman's just pointing out the difficulty all over again. Okay, now we're going to get into some of the aspects of the nitty-gritty of this problem. Uh, do you want to go on at this point or take a little break and come back to this, or how do you feel? Are you, are you too bored already? Do you need a break? Go on? Okay. All right. Okay. Here's what we're talking about. And this was taken from a paper that I didn't get to give, but it's been written anyway. And uh, we're talking about a minimal quantitative model which treats the question of accelerated decay rate. What kind of model could we use that will actually give us enough energy to really cause these nuclear uh, uh, isotopes to have a decay rate change? Okay? And we're looking at conditions that would not be in the solidified stable Earth because there just isn't that much energy there that can impart those millions of electron volts of energy into those nuclei. You need an environment that would be much, much more energetic. And so you remember, if those of you who were here when I gave the previous talk on the origin of chemical elements from water, I used as the basis of the origin of chemical elements that the water that God created was transformed into a plasma. And that meant that the water molecules were broken apart, all the atoms of hydrogen and oxygen, which make up the water molecules, were all stripped down to their nuclei, and that was a very high energy plasma environment. And in that plasma environment, the processes went on to create all the elements. And I talked about that. Well, it's the same plasma environment that we talked about then that we're talking about now. That plasma environment not only created all the stable elements, but it created the radioactive elements as well. Okay? So the geological or geothermal conditions within the first three days or the third day of creation would seem to be favorable to accelerate this rate if you want to admit a plasma. Okay? A bomb gardener doesn't necessarily agree with that, but I'm not worried about that. Okay, so if we take the Genesis account, as I said, literally, it's not unreasonable to conclude that the chemical elements, and I talked all about that in the last talk, and they might have the CDs available, you can get it, and they were produced all in that time frame, okay? Remember, God's spirit moved over the waters, and that Hebrew word can mean what? Agitating or imparting energy, right? The idea that that water is being broken up, being changed into what? A plasma of nuclei. 
Okay, and so all of that would have happened within those first three days of creation. Now here are the foundations of the model. All isotopes, including radioisotopes, had already been created in their fixed ratios. That was a process that had been determined by the nature of what they were to begin with. So that didn't change with time, at least initially, right? Okay, so those conditions would have been essentially the same in if the Earth had not, uh, uh, the environment of the Earth had not changed. In other words, they're the conditions that we see in the Earth's crust today, supposedly, although I don't believe that they were always originally in the same ratio by any stretch of the imagination. The relative concentrations pertinent to the study, having uh, regarded as having uniform distributions in the crust, currently accepted. Well, why do I have to do that? Because I know that based upon our modern knowledge of where those radioisotopes are, they're not way down there near the mantle, they're further up into the crustal portion. They've all been displayed up in there. So you've got to have some quantitative numbers to deal with, and that's where we get those quantitative numbers from where those isotopes really are. Okay? That's the reason for that. We have no way of guessing what they would have been originally anyway. So, Now, since the geothermal energies of creation would have been the same for all the elements, right, okay, in the plasma environment, then all of the pertinent elemental nuclei will be treated within the dynamics of what the plasma does, right, the plasma framework. And we will have two types of dynamics that are involved here. One is magnetohydrodynamics, which is a very strong environment in the plasma. The other is electrostatics of the plasma. So those are the two main factors that are involved. Now, the actual dynamics, the rheology of the mantle, which is, of course, not a solid entity as we understand it to be, but it is more liquid, right? It's crucial to geothermal stability of the Earth as it's structured now. But it wouldn't have been a factor in the plasma because the plasma was all the same. So the plasma was actually, that we had no divisions into crust, mantle, and all of that. We had what? One plasma initially, right? Eventually it's going to become what? Crust, mantle, core, right? but not in the beginning, okay? So this model is focusing on that portion of the pl primordial plasma which conforms ultimately to the formation of the crust. I don't know how the mantle got separated from the crust, and I, I don't even know how the core got formed, and nobody knows what the core is all about anyway. There's only guesswork about the chemical composition of the core. We don't know that that core is iron and nickel, as it's presumed to be. We have no idea. We have no way of measuring that. All indirect evidence, and the supposition is it's iron and nickel. I could probably find a half a dozen or more different element combinations that would satisfy the same criteria and not be iron and nickel at all. So we don't know anything about that. But if we look at these radiometric uh, isotopes, I'm dealing with uranium, the two types, 238, 235. I'm dealing with thorium, samarium is another one that's used and rubidium and potassium. These are the major isotopes that are used for dating, okay? So I'm dealing with those. This is the amount that's there known to be in parts per billion as we know it to be now. These are the percent of those isotopes that would be contained in the crustal sample, okay? The number, uh, the net concentration in parts per billion would be these, and then the masses of those in grams for each, each of these, those amounts would be these amount of masses, and then the number of atoms of each type would be determined from that. Now, I need to deal with individual atoms because it's individual atoms that get affected, so for the purposes of calculations, we need to know that. You don't need to know that. Now, one of the things about the plasma is we can arrive at the temperature. There are different ways of doing that. This is one way. If you knew the energy per unit volume, which is EV, if you knew the density and you knew the heat capacity, a constant pressure, Cp. Those, that combination would give you a temperature. Now, it turns out that this number and this number, these two bottom numbers, D and Cp, they're not these numbers right here. That's a mistake. I, they were wrong numbers that were chosen. And in fact, they should be much larger than what these numbers are over here. Okay? 
So that's a change. Furthermore, this energy per unit volume is not the energy derived from the bulk modulus divided by the volume. Because the energy derived from the bulk modulus does relate to the volume, by definition, the bulk modulus is a volume quantity. So if you derive the energy from that, it's already an energy per unit volume. So these numbers would have to be changed. Is this equation wrong? No, the equation's right. It's just the numbers that are wrong. Is the answer wrong? No, the answer's right, because you can arrive at it about two or three different ways. So this order of magnitude of about 10 billion years, 10 billion degrees, 10 billion degrees Kelvin is a right order of magnitude, okay? But I just didn't want you to believe that these numbers were correct here, okay? So this is the result. We have what kind of temperature? An enormous temperature. Well, the, technically, the, the plasma is always defined in terms of the uh, individual atoms that have been totally stripped to bare nuclei and bare electrons. Okay, so you've got a C of these positive nuclei and these electrons. We, we call these nuclei nuclides, N-U-C-L-I-D-E-S, nuclides. That's what they're called, nuclides. And these nuclides and these electrons make up the plasma. Now, the fact is they're dissociated. So those electrons are not combined with those nuclides anymore. They're all undergoing their independent you know, positions. So the plasma is really not a rigid state. It's a dynamic environment. Okay, But trying to treat the dynamics of the plasma and looking at these details is a horrendous problem. And it's, uh, it's insurmountable. So you've got to treat it as in like uh, a frozen core, as if these particles were interacting in, in positions that are relatively stable. And it's not a bad approximation because we use it in the gas laws all the time, you know, <laughs> these relationships, okay? And we use it in other environments, too. So that's what we have to do. Now, incidentally, I have a couple of copies of a paper I left downstairs which deal with this question about this, and it relates to the sun, paper I did back in 1994 at the ICC. And it, it gives you all the details for you guys who are deep into the physics and want to know all the mathematics and all. You can see some stuff in those papers. And it's, it's, it's data there that relates to this same kind of data that we're talking about here. Because the sun's core is a plasma. You know that. Okay? I just wanted you to know that. There are a couple of copies if you are that kind of person. And one side. Now here's an important property of the plasma. It's called this uh, wave. It's actually a, uh, a, a Debye wavelength, uh, they, they call it, but it's really a Debye length. Related to it as a length, a distance. Okay. Now that distance is related to a wavelength in the frequency that goes on in the plasma. That's all connected. This equation governs that. It's in error because it needs an E squared on the bottom, but nonetheless, it's the, there's an equation for that. And here's that kind of plasma we're talking about, okay? Kind of thing that looks something like that. Thermal pressure is involved, okay? So the thermal pressure has to be considered. Here's how you do the thermal pressure. You need these things. You need these numbers of electrons, these numbers of particles other than the electrons. You need the volume. And of course, the Boltzmann constant. 